Good evening and welcome to our service. I want to uh, welcome our visitors and uh, thank you for joining us for our services this evening and our times of worship. We'll meet again Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock for Bible study and again Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study and 10 o'clock for worship and then of course 5 o'clock in the evening. If you're visiting with us for the first time in the pew in front of you, there are some yellow cards. If you fill one of those out and as you leave, place it in the basket so we'll have a record of your visit with us. I have several sick this evening. Uh, Zelma Evans, Nancy Farley, Tricia Griffin, Dorothy Chang is staying at home uh, due to the uh, new COVID strain. Uh, and Lewis Chang is, is having tightness in his chest. And Judy Webb is still not feeling well. Uh, let's not forget uh, our shut-ins, uh, Dick Stewart, uh, uh, Bill Orr, Warren Boss. Drew Walker is working. Uh, Tullus Crawford is going, out of t going to Vanderbilt Wednesday to see uh, uh, a doctor about his heart. And Lou will be going out of town for three days, starting today, this evening, I mean, or Monday, Monday. Drew Walker is working. We have several out of town. Uh, I didn't check, so I, I need to look around real quick, make sure some of them didn't come back. <laughs> I have Cannon and Stacy Ford, uh, the Blanchards. I see the Simpsons are back. Uh, Hubers, Romines, uh, the Valenzuelas, Kevin and Kayla, Vivian Minders, and Caitlin Wooten. Fosses. And the Fosses, thank you. Uh, group four meets after services this evening. Is there anything I forgot to announce? I have it here. In fact, very first one. <laughs> I missed it. Nancy Farley's not feeling well either. Serving this evening. I have Mike Redman with the audiovisual. Our song leader is Greg Redman. Opening prayer by Craig Cruz. I'll have the closing prayer. Uh, Joe Cruz will have the uh, Lord's Supper talk. And uh, preaching this evening while uh, Carlos is out of town will be Ron Griffin.
Let us pray. Our righteous and merciful Heavenly Father, dear Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this evening, for this beautiful day that we've had, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together again amongst ourselves and to praise you and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're grateful for the songs that we get to sing, how they nourish our hearts and our minds, we, and they teach us and we teach each other. Father, we are so grateful for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He did love us so much that he came to this earth. He lived a perfect example of life. And then he gave himself on the cross for us so we could live forever with you in heaven. Father, we ask that you be with those who are mentioned among us that are sick and that you lay your healing hand upon them. Be with those who are traveling at this time. May you keep them safe and watch over them. Father, we pray that this congregation will continue to grow in spirit and grow in number. We ask that you watch over each and every member. We thank you for this opportunity as always. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. On the first day of the week, we as Christians assemble to offer our worship to God, and part of that worship is to partake in the Lord's Supper to commemorate Jesus' death for us and proclaim it again. Any present this time who wish to partake in that command? 
Let's give thanks. Well, before we do that, I would like to read to you from Revelation. This talks about how awesome and mighty Jesus is and what he has done for us. And to see this, uh, see this scene on the throne in Revelation chapter 5 and to think about the fact that because of what he did for us, we'll be able to personally see that, that, th uh, that side ourselves one day. That's pretty awesome. Then I, said at the then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But <clears throat> no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the, seal, the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. With that thought in mind, those who are about to partake the Lord's Supper, keep that in mind as we give thanks for the bread. Our Lord God in heaven, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us another opportunity to assemble before you and offer you our worship. Lord God, we pray that you are pleased with our worship today, and that we exalt you and exalt your Son and your Holy Spirit in the way that we should. We thank you for your great love for us, and we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals, he who died for us and lived again. We give you our thanks now for this bread, which is to us his, his body that he freely offered on the cross to take our place, and he, he took all of our sin upon him, Heavenly Father. Pray for those that are about to partake of this bread that they do so in a way that pleases you. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus. Amen. Offer our thanks again. Lord God in heaven, we come to you again now, ask, giving you our thanks for this unleavened fruit of the vine, which is to us Jesus Christ's precious blood that spilled on the cross for us and covers our sins and makes us as white as snow again if we'll lay hold of the salvation that you put before us, Lord God. Be with those who are about to partake of this. May they please you in doing so. This is our prayer through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
athletes from all over the world are gathered in Tokyo right now. I watched the uh, opening ceremonies. They're a little different this year than what's been. Of course, the, the uh, Olympics was supposed to be last year. And because of the pandemic, they weren't able to have it. And so they're having it this year. And then even then, you know, it, it's kind of taken a backward step. Originally, they thought that they would be able to have people come in and observe. And then they've, the pandemic, uh, the, the virus has begun to flare up again in Tokyo. And I guess our country too in places. So uh, they, they've banned spectators from coming in. But um, they're still having the Olympics. And of course the Olympics, that's something that is, um, we can trace its history back about 22, 2300 years. And it's amazing. The Greeks began with that and had the games. And uh, it, it's, it's also interesting. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. It's also interesting that the Apostle Paul noted the games that were so popular at that time. Maybe Paul was a sports enthusiast. We don't know, but he certainly referred to it. It certainly was something that the people talked about and were, uh, were familiar with. I was in a church one time where if you didn't talk about sports and what was going on in the sports world, you pretty much didn't have much to talk about with other people. You know, that's, that seemed to be the topic on a lot of people's minds in that particular church. So the, when, we, when we look at, trying to get the clicker to work here. There. When we look at what Paul wrote about it, the references that he made of the athletic games in comparison to serving Christ, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. First, Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Someone that evidently followed the Apostle Paul's writing style in the book of Hebrews, and the reason why I say that is because many believe that the Apostle Paul himself wrote the book of Hebrews, the internal evidence seems to suggest otherwise, but whoever wrote it certainly wrote in a Pauline fashion like, like the Apostle Paul wrote. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 he wrote, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the snare which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So these references to the games, the Olympic games that the Greeks started and it continued to be very popular in the days of Paul, are made as a comparison to us as Christians. So there, there obviously are some lessons that we might learn from Paul's notification or notice of, of sports and, and our own knowledge of, of sports. First of all, we want to look at some appropriate lessons that one may learn from the athletics as the Apostle Paul used it. First of all, personal discipline. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and first part of verse 27, he said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. And anyone, when you think about it, I am amazed often 
at the Olympic athletes and what they have to do to train to get into the Olympics. It's a full-time job. And for many of them, it's seven days a week. Every day, they're out there for six, seven, eight hours, maybe even more, working on their sport, whatever it may be. And they are out there uh, practicing and, and getting their body stronger. They're on special diets, special exercises, just so they can compete against athletes from all over the world. And certainly, uh, they, they look forward to winning. Endurance and self-control is necessary to win an eternal crown also. So we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Living the life of a Christian, as, ob as we have often noted, is not a sprint. It's a long distance run. And I enjoy watching. That's one of the events that I enjoy watching in the Olympics is the track and fields. And to watch those runners, and they amaze me that they are able to run the speeds that they do, the distances that they do, because I never was a distance runner. And it, it, always, uh, it always impressed me, anybody that could have that, that kind of endurance to go those long distances. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, But also for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness uh, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. So we would observe, first of all, as Peter is encouraging us, that as we grow in our faith, we need to grow in self-control and perseverance. And that takes some application on our part. He goes on to say in verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So part of our life as a Christian is having that personal discipline to be able to endure, to be able to never give up, to be able to be in the race, as it were, as Paul calls it a race, the writer, the Hebrew writer called it a race, that we're in this race and it's, a, it's an endurance race. It's a long distance race. You never, ever quit. I remember in past Olympics of watching runners, in, in, well, I remember particularly one hurdler where they, the, the runner tripped over a hurdle and then just walked off the track. And even the commentators that were talking about it said, you never do that. You never do that. And later on they showed a short little clip of that, of that runner's coach telling him what for. <laughs> because he walked off the track and didn't finish the race. And then I've seen others who fell down during a race and they got up and while they finished way behind everybody else, yet they went ahead and finished the race. And that's what athletes are trained to do. You stick to it. You, get, you stick to it right through the end. Another positive thing that we get learned from athletics is keeping the rules. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, And also if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. I think that's something that's extremely obvious in sports. Nobody ever got up to play baseball. Well, I say nobody did. I'm, I've seen some, some video clips of little kids hit the ball and head for, towards third base. You know, just a little bit confused about what direction they ought to go. Well, we know. Well, you gotta, you've got to run the bases accordingly. First base, second base, then third base. And then if you're lucky, you'll make it on into home. But there's rules in every sport. And if you break the rules, then you are disqualified. Now, I don't know why people can understand that in regards to serving God. That we have rules in which we live in order to be pleasing to God. In life, we have the same rule book. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. Nevertheless, to the degree we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. But it seems that many people in religion 
have the idea that it really doesn't make any difference what you do or how you do it, as long as you're sincere. Do you think that would apply in any of the sporting games that the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote about and applied to? That, well, I was sincere. I believed that it was the right thing to do to go to third base first. I was sincere. I believed it was all right to take that kick off and run around the stadium and get into the end zone and the other end that way. You avoid a lot of trouble that way, you know. Well, sincerity isn't going to qualify you in the sporting world. But people think it will in religion. It doesn't. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The equipment that we have comes from the Word of God. And as Jude wrote in Jude verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's another thing. The, the rule book by which we live, the Word of God, was given one time for all people. I don't have this verse on the chart here, but I'd refer you to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. There the Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus Christ died once for all. It's exactly the same phrase in the Greek language, in the original language, that's found here in Jude verse 3. We don't have any trouble understanding at all that Jesus died one time for all people for all time. Jude makes it very clear that the word that was given to us, the faith, the one faith that Paul writes about in Ephesians 4 was given one time for all people, for all time. Another lesson that we learn is teamwork. Not in application to sports, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 27, uh, Paul does, tells us through the Holy Spirit about our need to work together like a body works together, that we all have our own function. And certainly there have been a lot of lessons presented on that verse, and appropriately so. It teaches us that we need to cooperate, that we have to work together. And that's one of the emphasis in sports, in the, especially, in, of course, in team events. Not all sporting events are team events, but in team events... One of the things that they are taught, and I know that because I've played in enough team events to know that it's emphasized you have to have teamwork. You can have the best player in the world on a team, and if that player is playing with other teammates who aren't working together, you're not going to have a winning team. It, it takes more than one person on the team to win. And it takes everyone working together. A lot has been said about Tom Brady. Tom Brady is a great quarterback, undoubtedly. You know, he goes from one team to another just to prove that he's a great quarterback. He went from New England down to uh, Florida and uh, to Buccaneers and won another Super Bowl. But I'll tell you what, Tom Brady would be nothing without a strong line, without those that were defending him and good receivers that would receive the, the passes that he made. And so it takes them all working together. So we are to strive together, as the Apostle wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. We must be united, striving with one mind. You see, when you have one mind, that means you're all of one accord, that you're all together, united. Just like Paul says that we ought to be as a body, that the body has to work together in order to function properly. We have to strive together with one mind for the faith of the gospel. 
Another positive that we learn is competition. Now, we're not competing with one another as Christians, but we are competing. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? There's a reason why Paul writes this. And that is to tell us that we are involved in a competition, but we're not in a competition against each other. We're in a competition against our adversary. We have someone out there that is working against us, as it were, playing this game, if you will, against us as a Christian. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Did you, did you notice here even the, the Olympic Games application in this verse? Wrestling. We're wrestling against an adversary that the Apostle Peter wrote about in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So that's where our wrestling match is. As we go on back there in Ephesians chapter 6, if we wanted to look at that, he talks about the armor that protects us, that allows us to stand against our adversary. There he's talking about that in regards to a battle, as it were. So we wrestle against the spiritual forces of this world. But then there are also some inappropriate lessons one may learn from athletics. First of all, that the idea of winning at all costs. I was very involved in, in sports, in, in school. Uh, well, actually, where I was from, we had a football team in the fifth grade. <laughs> yeah, putting on pads and getting out there and learning how to play football. That's what you do in Oklahoma. And, and one of the things that was, that was hammered into us in, in whatever sport we were involved in was... You go out there and you do your best and let the chips fall what, where may. In other words, if you don't win, is you, if you did your best, if you feel good about the way that you played, the way that you worked together, then that's what counts. But there are people who have the idea that it doesn't matter what you do to win, you just have to go out and win. Winning, it's all about winning. And that's a sad sad attitude in athletics. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul were, it tells us, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. We have to beware that we don't get the idea that we can cheat. Now this word cheat here means to be taken captive, actually. But the idea that we can cheat or be cheated in regards to the philosophy and the empty deceit of the world. Breaking the rules and unsportsmanship uh, should not be tolerated in sports. And certainly it's not in regards to our service to the Lord. There are many verses again that tell us that we walk by the same rule and that we need to be just and fair in all that we do as Christians. Then there's peer pressure. Peer pressure can come from sports because it, it sometimes uh, athletes get the idea of, of well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm better than you and, and, and you're nothing. And it, it causes that kind of pressure for people in order to be able to try to improve themselves and to prove themselves. Following the crowd is always dangerous. Jesus teaches us, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. I don't know of um, any greater, I mean, there, there's peer pressure in every aspect of life. But having been involved in sports a good part of my life, I know that there's that pressure to be able to, to fit in with the team. 
And sometimes the teammates want to, you know, maybe some of the more popular athletes want you to do things that you shouldn't be doing as a Christian. They want to participate in things that you shouldn't. And we hear about that sometimes in college and professional sports where athletes get themselves into embarrassingly and deep trouble because they were involved with the other athletes in some kind of a party situation or something that caused them to be involved in something they shouldn't have been involved in. Those scandals from the ball team sometimes that we talk about. So that's something that, that is not a positive lesson that people get from athletics. And the rule breakers that want others to come with them, as we said, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul here is writing about those that were uh, Judaizing teachers and how that they were pressuring others to follow along with them. He, Paul wrote this, they zealously court you but to no good. And sometimes that's the way it is with ungodly people is they will try to get you to follow with them. And that's a lesson that you don't want to learn in athletics. And then there's physical abuse of the body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Sometimes athletes will use steroids and other unlawful drugs to stay in the game. And that's plagued some of the Olympic players in the past. And in these Olympics this year, there was a runner who had a great gift. I remember them making a special uh, focus on her on one news sports broadcast this year. And she talked about how that she was just a natural runner. She says, it's always been natural to me. And they were talking about what a big favorite she was to win. And then she tested positive for marijuana. And dropped out, had to drop out of the Olympics. So whether she was using marijuana in, in some way to enhance her running skills, I don't know that it would. But there have been many instances of athletes using steroids and, and other illicit, illicit drugs, uh, enhancing drugs, in order to be able to win. And there's the concussion effects. That's been something that has been addressed in recent times, and I'm glad that they did. And they've made rules, particularly in football, that protect runners and tacklers from keep them from spearing, using their head in order to uh, make a, a hit. And we've also heard of concussion in soccer and, well, even baseball and things like that. There can be concussions. And so one has to make sure that they keep their body healthy and, and not abusing their body. And then there's the overemphasis of sports. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Paul wrote, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. While there are some great lessons that we learn from sports, as we noted already, we see here that as the Apostle Paul writes about the things that we need to be meditating on, the things that we need to be concentrating on, are the things that help us serve God, not hinder us from serving God. Nobody playing sports will get the eternal reward because they were good at their sport. If you'll recall Brother Carlos's uh, sermon from July the 11th, now, if you haven't seen that sermon or heard that sermon, I, I encourage you to watch it on YouTube. But he talked about how that the Brigham Young University sports teams, whatever it may be, football, basketball, baseball, track, 
whatever team it was that they refused to play on Sunday. And you know, I can't think of a more admirable position for a Christian to say, I'm not letting sports come between me and my service to my Lord. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Lindy McDaniel. Lindy McDaniel was a professional baseball pitcher, relief pitcher, from 1955 to 1975, 20 years in professional baseball. Started out with the St. Louis Cardinals, went to the Chicago Cubs, played with another National League team, I forgot now exactly which one it was, and then he went to uh, the uh, New York Yankees in the American League, and finally ended his career with the Kansas City Royals. And that's, uh, I started to say that's where I met Lindy, that's not true. I met Lindy back about 1963 or 64 uh, at, at my hometown in southwest Oklahoma. The church there was having a gospel meeting, and, and Lindy was from southwest Oklahoma, from Hollis, just south a little bit from where I grew up. And he came up during that gospel meeting and, and supported the, the work that was being done there that, that week. So that's when I first met him, but I was just a kid. You know, I didn't, I mean, I saw him, I was told who he was, and okay, fine. Yeah. But then when he was in Kansas City, and, and I moved to Kansas City, and, and he had retired from baseball at that time, and opened up a bookstore. And I went over and visited with him, and we became friends, and got to know him very well, and, and uh, knew each other for many years. He passed away uh, last November from COVID at the age of 84. Now, I mentioned the professional ball teams that Lindy played with. There's one I've forgotten, one other team in the National League. I, I don't know anyway, but every ball team that he signed with, he had them agree that he would never miss a Sunday worship service to play ball. And they agreed to it. So that wherever they were, wherever they were traveling, if they had a Sunday game and it started early, he would be worshiping with a local church. And then he'd go to the game. And many talked about how that Lindy really should have been a starting pitcher. But I think the reason why he was a relief pitcher for those 20 years is just for that reason. So that he would be able to go and worship and then go to the game and if they needed him he could be put in it's i want you to if you if you get the chance you think about it i you go ahead and google lindy mcdaniel and read about his career it was awesome he ha holds some pitching records he was an awesome ball player right-handed pitcher and that's one thing that lindy understood was that his commitment to jesus christ was stronger than it was to baseball, to his career, his livelihood. Sports may be valuable in learning some lessons that helps one in life as a Christian, but it can also be a distraction from the Christian life. We need to make sure that we don't get so wrapped up in sports that that becomes our main focus in life. Because as we already noted, no sport is going to get you to heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things will be added to you, Jesus said in Matthew 6.33. And as I said, Brother Carlos had an excellent lesson on forsaking the assembly. And I would like to think that no Christian would ever forsake coming together to be with other Christians, but especially to worship their Lord at any time for a game. We should embrace the positive and avoid the negative. 
This evening, we invite uh, anyone that's not obeyed the gospel. We give the invitation that Jesus gives. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we talk about, I have decided to follow Jesus, we need to understand what a great commitment that is. That Jesus Christ must come first in every aspect of your life. It comes first in your career, if you're a professional baseball player, or, or if you're a, a doctor, a lawyer, or Indian chief, or a ditch digger. Jesus Christ comes first in your life. And so when you make a decision to follow Jesus, it's to put Him first and to walk in His steps. We talked this morning about how that, well, there's, you know, there's no perfect people, but there's a perfect Savior. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God and you're willing to change your life and dedication to Him and follow Him, repenting of sin... Tonight you need to confess your faith before this audience and in the words of Saul of, uh, of Ananias to Saul of Tarsus. And now why would you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord as we stand and sing. Please come. I have to follow. Thank you, Ron. Is there anything that needs to be mentioned before we dismiss in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here this evening to worship you, to hear your word proclaimed to us. We pray, dear God, that we take the truths that have been presented this evening and apply them to our lives. We ask, dear God, that you go with us as we depart from this place, that you be our guest, that, that we will do as you would expect us to do, that we will be lights in our community. We pray, dear God, that the things that we do, the things that we say, will be the example that you would want us to be. Forgive us of our sins, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen.